Good afternoon and welcome everyone. It is such a pleasure to have you here for the fourth session in the Minister of Agriculture's digital series, Climate Change and Adaptation Leaders. I'm Jennifer Haverstock and I'm the Manager of Horticulture with Perennia and I'll be the moderator for today's session. We have a terrific, terrific lineup of speakers today, but before we get to them, I wanna go over a few housekeeping notes and also share with you a message from the Minister of Agriculture and our sponsors for today's session. Um, all participants will have their audio and video turned off during the webinar. If you'd like to ask a question, then we ask you to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if preferred, you can also um, ask a question in the chat function of, during the webinar. Uh, the chat and Q&A will be monitored throughout the whole session and addressed during the live Q&A happening at the end of the presentations. Um, and some of the questions will be answered throughout the, the session by our panelists as they see fit. And so now I will um, introduce you to the minister and his message. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you here this morning under the climate change discussion with some industry experts I think you'll find very interesting. I first of all want to thank our sponsors, the Farm Credit Canada, the Nova Scotia Loan Board, and also Dalhousie University and Nexus for the great work they're doing in the communities to help our farming industry. A few years ago, when I became minister, almost eight years now, climate change was on the horizon. But the things that have happened in that very short time, we've seen droughts uh, pretty well on a continuous basis in different parts of the province. We've seen frost at times of year that should never be frost, hurricanes and all the things that have caused problems for our industry. And it's exciting to see how we can adjust and adapt to those problems. Hopefully with this discussion today, will be some new ideas, new approaches that we can take to help our industry and help it grow. We put programs in place to help it grow, and we will continue to put programs together to help you. It's important that we talk about climate change more and more, not only to talk about it, but also take positive steps to do everything we can to minimize the, the cause of climate change. It's been a pleasure working with the industry, and it's wonderful to see the industry, business, and universities coming together to work on these solutions. And I want to congratulate the University, at Dalhousie University, Nexus, and our farming, farming community for working together on this uh, important topic. Wish everyone success today, and I'm sure that will spur some very interesting discussion and discussion that we'll help you but find solutions with if it's possible. Again, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Minister. Our overall series sponsors are Farm Credit Canada and the Nova Scotia Farm Loan Board, and they have some uh, videos for us to watch as well. Who is FCC? Well, our About Us is really about you, the goals you want to reach, and the dreams you have. You're invested in your business, and as the only lender 100% invested in Canadian agriculture and food, so are we. Because a dream is just the start. It also needs a lender who understands where your dreams come from, where they can go, and what it takes to get there. If you want to start, grow, or transform your agriculture or food business, we can help. Because we're not just your lender, we're your champion your catalyst, and we're behind you every step of the way. We are FCC. Dream. Grow. Thrive. My name is Alphonse Vermeulen. My wife and I farm 50 dairy cows on a robot in Urbania, Nova Scotia. We, we actually got married in 2014 and bought the farm in 2014. And originally we owned a tie stall in Princeport, um, and it was just January of 2020 that we moved to this site in Urbania. Uh, we've been working with the Farm Loan Board since the beginning, when we first bought the farm in Princeport. The Farm Loan Board was uh, more flexible with the challenges we were facing trying to enter the industry. They helped us actually to do this site switch. Um, they provided us with a loan that helped us to retrofit 
the barn that we're standing in right now, that was a tremendous, tremendous help. It was a big step for us to move from the tie stall to the milking facility that we have here. So with the loan board, uh, we do, we're, we're character lenders and we do like to develop relationships with our clients. Um, and what that means is through the years, we get to see how people are progressing and how they're growing. Uh, we get to see their weaknesses as well as their strengths. Uh, we do look at, uh, we, we review their financials uh, yearly, and we like to see where we can uh, make that better and make them stronger. So we're really a complement to the other lending options. You know, we, we say that we don't compete with banks or, or other lending agencies. What we really want to do is provide um, a solution for farmers that is different than what's being offered commercially. Really diving down on the business plan, working with them to make sure that they have a partnership um, with other programs or granting opportunities um, is really what we're focused on. They understood a lot of things that even we didn't understand and, and uh, it really helped us navigate some, some tough times when you're trying to get into the industry. Excellent, and we have two more videos to share. Our session sponsors are Nexus Robotics and Dalhousie's Faculty of Agriculture. So let's take a moment just to learn more about them. So the purpose of the robot is to be able to remove weeds that are very close to the crop without damaging the crop. So Nexus Robotics, we're a very small startup out of uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. We have made giant steps in 2020 uh, in our uh, research and development. Uh, our mission is, is really to use artificial intelligence to the benefit of uh, agriculture, while our vision ultimately is to become a staple for vegetable farmers. that's forever changing, evolving, one thing remains the same. We will always need agriculture. At Dalhousie's Agriculture Campus in Truro, Nova Scotia, we're providing education to future leaders in agriculture. We take pride in over 10,000 alumni, many who have gone on to become leaders in the industry. When the rest of the world shuts down, our industry steps up, ensuring there's always food on the table. Our programs have been designed to provide solutions to some of the world's greatest challenges, helping lead to a brighter tomorrow. Agriculture is our future. It's that simple. Discover the possibilities at dal.ca slash thinkagriculture. Great, and I also wanted to share uh, the final two sessions in the agricultural digital series, which I hope you can attend. So please remember to register. Um, next week on Tuesday, April 20th is the second annual Minister's Awards of Excellence, Excellence in Agriculture. And then on Wednesday, April 28th, we have the Entrepreneur Forum, uh, Staying Resilient in Challenging Times. Now on to, to today's session. Here are our terrific slate of speakers. Uh, before diving into the presentations, I wanted to take a quick moment to highlight that three of the farmers that we have with us today represent the various commodities participating in the Nova Scotia government's agriculture champions for environmental sustainability program, also termed ACES. Uh, the three commodities that are participating in this exciting initiative are beef, beef horticulture and Christmas trees. 
Um, and to complement the perspective that these producers will share with us today, uh, we also have uh, Dr. David Burton, who will set the stage with us related to climate change and agriculture. And uh, Tarek Greenin of Nexus Robotics will discuss advanced technologies in agriculture. Um, the contact information for the presenters will be shared with you and any PDFs or presentations will be on the Perennia website shortly after the, the webinar today. And this webinar will also be available on the Perennia YouTube channel. Um, so then just before we get started, a quick reminder, please feel free uh, for the audience to use the Q&A or the chat functions to ask questions throughout the sessions. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and uh, move on to our first presenter. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. David Burton from Dalhousie University. Dr. Burton is a soil scientist and professor in the Department of Plant Food and Environmental Sciences in the Faculty of Agriculture. Uh, his current research programs involve an examination of the production and consumption of greenhouse gases in natural and agricultural landscapes, the development of tools for the measurement of soil nitrogen supply to plants, the influence of climate on soil biological processes, and the assessment of the quality of the soil biological environment and its influence on soil health. So please welcome me or join me in welcoming Dr. Burton to our screen. Thanks very much, Jen. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So today I wanted to spend just a few minutes introducing our session by talking about two concepts that uh, we've been talking about quite a bit lately, soil health and climate change, and, and, and spend a bit of time talking about how those two are linked. If we think about soils, we need to be aware of the variety of things that soils do for us. Some of them are obvious, like as in agriculture, we understand that soils supply nutrients and water to plants and help our crops grow, but also soils clean our water supply to ensure that we have a, a plentiful and safe water supply. Soils are also the most biodiverse uh, habitat on the planet, so provide a lot of services in terms of providing uh, pharmaceuticals um, for, for medical use, but also providing genetic diversity within our uh, biosphere. And also they have a very important role in regulating climate change. One of the things I'm gonna focus a little bit on today in terms of carbon storage. Soils are one of the major storehouses of carbon on the planet. The challenge is that things aren't all well within the soil world. Uh, soil degradation has become of great concern internationally. Uh, in 2015, there is a, a United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization study on the state of soil degradation globally. And they concluded from that study that we only have 60 harvests left to, that will be sufficient to provide our population with the food necessary if we don't do something about soil degradation, an important if. So what do we need to do? Well, I wanna talk about two of the things that are driving soil degradation. Not, not because they're necessarily bad things, but I want to present the perspective that sometimes too much of a good thing isn't such a good thing. The first one I want to talk about is the plow. The plow revolutionized agriculture. It allowed for us to prepare a seed bed, control weeds, uh, and, and provide an a, 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 a excellent environment for our monoculture type cropping systems. The challenge was with any, as we disturbed the soil, soil organic matter was, the, was being degraded, was being consumed by the, the organisms that live in the soil. And as a result, too much tillage is not a good thing. And one of the things we're seeing in, in uh, Canadian agriculture, but internationally, is that uh, systems that have excessive amounts of tillage are experiencing dramatic decreases in soil organic matter content which are compromising their ability to function, as well as releasing CO2 to the atmosphere. And so that's one of the things we need to be aware of in Nova Scotia and, and, and address. Here's a map from uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Environmental uh, Indicator Series that, that depicts this situation. Uh, we can see that in, in Prairie Canada, we have lots of green where through the adoption of reduced tillage practices, they're actually able to build up organic matter in the soil, remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and help solve the climate problem. Whereas we in the East, and particularly in Atlantic Canada, we're not as far along in that process. 
because of our, our, our intense utility systems, we're still losing uh, solar organic matter. And, and it's, it's not only releasing CO2, but it's also compromising the function of our soils. The other issue I want to raise is fertilization. Again, something that's transformed agriculture. It's allowed us to dramatically increase the amount of food we produce. Through the Haber-Bosch process, we doubled the amount of reactive nitrogen on our planet. And as a result, at least 50% of the food we eat every day is a result of this Haber-Bosch process and, and what it, the, new, the nitrogen that's brought into the cycle. But we can have too much of a good thing. And one of the challenges we ha now have is we have to find ways of more efficiently managing that nitrogen so it's not having adverse impacts on the surrounding environment, two of which are the production of nitrous oxide and the other is leaching nitrate to groundwater. Both are concerns within Nova Scotia. Here's another of the agri-environmental indicators that, uh, that presents the amount of nitrogen that's remaining in the, in the uh, soil after the harvest in the fall. And again, you'll see parts of Western Canada are doing okay, parts aren't doing as well, but here in the East, we're leaving a lot of nitrogen in the uh, soil in the fall. And that's a particular current concern for us because much of that nitrogen is lost over the winter period from the harvest to the next planting season. That's not nitrogen we can recover and use in the next season. It can be lost in the environment. I want to introduce the concept of soil health because it, in, it embraces how we can use solu these uh, solutions. Uh, soil management is a solution to these problems and address climate change issues. Soil health is about a more complete understanding of how soils function by both measuring the physical state of the soil, the state of compaction, the structure of the soil, the biological state of the soil, the, the microbial diversity and the organisms that are there and the activity, as well as the more traditional chemical indices of soil fertility that we've always used in the soil, test lab, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium content. Bringing those three concepts together allows us to understand and embrace the full function of soil in terms of its ability to continue to acts of vital living system, to, to live within ecosystem and land use boundaries, to sustain biological productivity, to promote the, the quality of our air and water, and maintain plant, animal, and human health, which is our ultimate objective. Over the last four years, we've established the Atlantic Soil Health Lab at Dalhousie, uh, where what we've been trying to do is conduct a survey of the state of soil in Nova Scotia, it's soil health by evaluating a, an analysis system out of Cornell University and constructing some baseline studies on the state of uh, health in Nova Scotia soils. There's a vast amount of information that's come out of that, but I wanna highlight one particular finding that I think highlights some of the, some of the challenge we, challenges we have in Nova Scotia, but also points to maybe some of the solutions. And here, what we've done is we've uh, plotted the rainfall, the, the aggregate stability of, of our soils, uh, and we've broken that down uh, by cropping system. So here I, on, on this axis, I'm, I'm um, presenting the percent of aggregates that are resistant to rainfall from 90% down to 10%. And I'm comparing that with three different, uh, five different cropping systems in, in Nova Scotia, field crops, forages, pasture, vegetable, and wild blueberry. And the only really important bit of information that I want you to get from that is you'll notice the systems that have lower soil disturbance pasture systems where roots are allowed to stay in place and are allowed to decay naturally. Wild blueberry production systems where roots are again allowed to stay in place. We see a much higher percentage of the aggregates in a water stable form. Some of the systems that have more disturbance, vegetable production systems, field crop systems, and in some cases forage production systems have a lower degree of aggregate stability. The message I want to get to you is not that these systems are bad, it's that now we have to find management approaches that allow us to disturb that soil a bit less, build up soil organic matter, and therefore uh, rebuild that aggregate stability. Why? Because that aggregate stability has important physical and chemical functions within the soil. So by, by increasing soil organic matter, we can increase the resilience, of our, the resilience of our systems and we can help them adapt to climate change. So they remove a significant amount of CO2 from the atmosphere. So that's good from a carbon sequestration climate change perspective. But more importantly, they also have these other functions that are, are key to our adaptation to climate change. They increase the water holding capacity of our soil and therefore uh, their ability to resist drought. 
they decrease the erosion potential of those soils, they'll increase the fertility of those soils, uh, and also increase the biodiversity of those soils that will allow them to be more resistant to disease. All important production practices and outcomes that, that we need to be focusing. So my message to you really is, is by focusing on soil health, there's a number of things we can do. By building soil organic matter through using practices like returning higher residue crop or using higher residue crops, keeping our soils covered uh, through the use of perennial crops or cover crops, adding organic uh, materials to our crops or to our soils like compost, manure, biosolid. We can build up that soil organic matter and through reducing disturbance, not eliminating tillage, but reducing our tillage to only where we only absolutely need it. I haven't talked about nitrous oxide, but also improved fertilizer management can reduce nitrous oxide emissions. That's a, a topic for a different day. But as a consumer, as a citizen, there's a number of things we can do. First of all, being very aware of how the food we're being consuming is being produced. Buying local, buying for, from sustainable production systems. We can also encourage our governments to monitor and report on the state of our soils to ensure that we're moving in the right direction. So I very briefly wanted to give you an introduction to the concept of soil health and how it can help us to respond to climate change and increase the resiliency of our production systems. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Jen. Jen, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Burton. Um, and I know that this has been uh, quite a big topic of conversation amongst the agriculture community in Nova Scotia. Um, lots of excitement, particularly around the soil health piece and the, the laboratory being set up here. So thank you very much for that contribution. Um, our next speaker today is Dean Manning from Manning Family Farm. Dean operates Manning Family Farm with his wife, Catherine, and his two children in Falmouth, Nova Scotia. The mixed farm operation consists of 80 head beef cow calf and greenhouses and market vegetable or market garden vegetables. Both Dean and Catherine are BSc graduates from um, the former Nova Scotia Agricultural College. After university, Dean spent 10 years working in agriculture extension before moving to the family farm full time. He's on the board of the Nova Scotia cattle producers and presently sits as the maritime representative on the Canadian beef Cattle Research Council and is presently the chair of the Maritime Beef Council. He is also chair of the Falmouth Great Dyke Marsh Body. Please join me in welcoming Dean. Thank you, Jen. Um, we'll just get loaded up here. So good afternoon, folks and everyone. Um, as Jen said, um, Oops, maybe we're not. There we go. Uh, we do have a small mixed farm operation and here in Falmouth, and we've kind of, um, I guess, deviated a little bit from the norm over the past. A lot of people specialized in one commodity, and we, we stuck with a, a mixed, uh, mixed operation um, with the cattle and the vegetables. They seem to complement one another. And one thing we've found over the years with, with, our, uh, with our operation is that um, the the, the vegetable ground it kind of it kind of uh, supports what Dave was uh, getting at. It, it supports the the livestock supports the vegetable ground because I I kind of firm believer that you know the um, the soil kind of needs some manure at some point. So whether you have livestock on it or or you incorporate some manure at some point, I think that's a, a good practice. So when asked to um, speak, you know with with climate change, um, said some of the new, you know, some things you're doing, and I thought about it for a little bit, and I said, well, my topic was basically on on the cattle portion of it. So I said, well, what what are we doing? You know, what what have we done? And you know, nothing seemed to stand out. And I said, well, maybe it's because we're constantly doing something and uh, all the time. And I, I guess as as producers, you, you you fall into that that if you have absolute problems, you try to come up with solutions. So. So back in the early uh, 2000s, we started implementing uh, best management practices here on the farm, and um, it it you know led into doing an agriculture biodiversity conservation plan, and you know we we had a good plan on um, it turned out you know very well for the farm just because of the practices that we were doing, and that report 
you know, it included looking at areas, riparian areas, the wetlands that we have on the farm, our upland areas, uh, different shelter belts, woodlands, the pastures, how, how we were treating the hay fields, croplands, and if we had some fallow lands as well. So, so we look at that report every once in a while and, and dig it out, especially in the last year or so, there's quite a bit of talk about biodiversity. And, and you know, I, I think a lot of farms are in this situation. And it's just kind of a quick fun fact here from the Beef Cattle Research Council is that 60%, 68% actually of all wildlife habitat on Canada's food producing land is found where beef cattle are raised. So, so it's a plus to have beef cattle in your community um, for, for that part alone. So, and we continue to work on these. So I guess when we, uh, you know, we're looking at climate change, you know, one of the things we've noticed is with everyone else, the weather does seem to be a lot more extreme. And it, it's either, it comes, it's either all drought or it seems to be all extreme rainfall. So, so I guess our solution on some of that's ponds and ditches is as simple as it may seem. Um, for example, like last summer, we had a, a pasture in an area that we had pastured on for 20 or 25 years and always all kinds of water. And, and last summer, that pond went dry. So to try to um, haul water for a large group of cattle, dig a pond, wait for the recharge, um, it's, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of planning and um, takes a lot of time and patience. So so, um, and in this particular case, it was a remote area. So it was quite a distance from the home farm. So, so it uh, took quite a bit of extra work to do it. So, you know, our plan moving forward is to put in more of these ponds in areas that we can, you know, protect our water, have lots of water available. Um, if you look on the picture on the right here, this, we're fortunate in our farm, we have a great freshwater uh, resource. It's been here um, uh, for a long time the key, since the Acadians started diking and these systems fed out into the small streams out into the ocean. And what we've done with our biodiversity, one of the first things we did was we, we uh, fenced these stream banks out so that we've got vegetative buffer areas and we've got lots of, lots of water and, and wildlife there. And I mentioned ditches as well. So, with these extreme rainfalls, the picture on the bottom left hand, you'll see where we're cleaning, keeping our main drains on our, our major dikes cleaned out. So when we have that big flush of water, uh, we can it can handle it and it's not flooding the land and the crops that we have in there. So back when we were looking at, uh, you know, increasing the beef herd, you know, we looked at the economics of beef production. And beef, beef production, you know, quite honestly, is, it's a low margin. Um, they're typically beef cattle are great for using marginal land, grasslands, and, and you're not, not as profitable cropland for vegetables and other higher end crops. So we looked at our resources that were around us and we we're fortunate here on the farm. We have a lot of rolling hills. And when we did clear some good production land, we left a lot of areas that were you know, not suitable for cropping or too hilly. And, um, you know, we looked at some areas that we could use for shelter belts, um, how we could extend our grazing season and even change our calving season to meet more with the time. So in this, uh, you know, photo here, you'll see the energy free water and bowl out front, just a slab on it for winter time. We piped wetter back into this shelter belt area. And this is a mixed stand of hardwoods and softwood on rolling hills uh, in back and behind it. And you can kind of see, too, the nice job I think the cattle do. They, the, the tree, the canopy above it is great, but down below they've kind of cleaned it out um, a little bit. So um, it just kind of makes a nice area for them. Now, when we move into extended season grazing, uh, uh, we've always heard in Western Canada, in different places in the lower states in the US, um, using corn for grazing. So I had tried it several years ago. Um, and had to try it again a few years back. It was just came in too wet to harvest a corn silage on the dike. So I said, well, let's let it freeze up and see what happens. And because the cattle were right there and where we'd been out wintering cattle, it was kind of interesting just to see if we could make it work. So in this stand here, um, you'll see the green grass growing in between the rows of corn. And it was a little different management practice than what uh, most people are doing. So a lot of people are seeding in this. But uh, with this piece of ground here, it was green sod that we 
that we plowed under but i didn't burn it down or anything i just left the the grass stay in so so the only herbicide on this would have been an annual herbicide to um just to take those annual weeds out and as the summer went on and more light started coming through the the perennial grasses that were in that sod crept up through so a lot of this would be grasses and some vetch that's coming through here so when we move into the grazing part itself and this is a pretty good uh, picture i guess showing lots of different things here but uh, we we go with very small areas um, for the cattle to graze because i want them to to uh, smash down everything they only eat the cobs the corn i don't make them eat the stalks if their leaves are there they'll eat them but typically the dry leaves are shattered by the time they get to them, especially this time of year. And we're just finishing up actually grazing. Uh, we'll probably finish this week that we started grazing last November on a small group. We're, we're still in the trial stages to see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the other thing you'll see, like we'll set up two or three uh, strip fences and you'll see to the left of the screen, there's a single or on this one, this case, there's a double uh, poly wire that we energize and just to kind of keep the cattle in because they will uh, the stocks can break them down a little bit uh, the fences if you're not careful in the background you can kind of see the the wooded stand or the shelter belt that we would use to winter these cattle in um, now the thing i really like about uh, the grazing part is uh, if you look in this picture someplace you'll have to look a little closely but these are the corn stalks that are smashed down to the ground it's got a good soil cover uh, you'll see the manure distribution. Uh, it's, it's spread out quite nicely. And up in the top um, top right of your screen, almost to the center, you'll see a couple of uh, green tufts of grass that are still there. So when spring rolls around with your, um, when the so soil start warming up in your biology or your soil starts taking place, you have all these elements uh, together, which should help um, keep the carbon in the soil and minimize it uh, at the release. So, and this picture kind of gives a, throughout the winter time, kind of how we're doing it. If you look uh, in the foreground or where the tower is way up there is, is the ungrazed crop. The cattle are in on a strip and between the cattle and this bale feeder uh, to the right hand side is the area that's been grazed. And we do feed probably uh, our, kind of our diet or target on this group of cattle was uh, about 65% of forage that we have in the background. And they get the rest of their feed, winter feed from, uh, we'll say 35% from the grain, from the corn cobs. And this should actually help improve feed efficiency because as you reduce the, uh, increase the starch com com components of the diet, uh, it should reduce their, their feed requirements because the corn is a little higher performance feed and it also reduces the fiber. So it should reduce the methane emissions as well from these cattle. Now, following um, the corn, what we like to do is just do a light disking, just enough to smooth it up in the, the spring on the previous slide that you've seen with the corn and the manure residue. And typically we'll go in with um, just a, a clover and an annual ryegrass uh, rotation, uh, maybe uh, covered with oats and peas. And with the idea of trying to fix the nitrogen and getting some cover on there so we get some good soil biology and activity taking place. And uh, a couple of places in the fall, different times, I guess I've looked and in the fall on this after it's been seeded. Um, if you look down at the soil litter, you, you won't find very many corn pieces at all. The soil, the biology of the soil is, is actually broken down all those pieces. So this is kind of like what we'd like to see. And I think if you look too at this kind of quality of forage when you start grazing, um, it's going to do a lot of things because you're doing nitrogen fixation. Uh, you're a lot more efficient on your uh, beef production and production per acre. So another area that uh, we've kind of moved into a little bit is using their wooded areas and the sites with uh, shelter belts. And you can kind of just see it's kind of it's one of those um, concepts that I think is, uh, feeds itself. So you have the animals in there, they're punching the leaves and the needles that have fallen off the tree from the previous year. Uh, they're, they're adding some manure because they go in there at night times or during the day and lounge around. And that kind of increases that, improves that cycle, the carbon cycle and the nitrogen fixation and organic matter. So you should have better tree growth. Um, the other thing I should mention with our shelter belts is we do rotate them around 
as well so we don't uh, ruin the forestry i mean if you have a high animal impact on a small area of trees yes you will damage your trees but when you spread your land base around and treat it the same idea as if you were rotational grazing then you will protect your trees as well so there are some sites that we're developing for wintering sites um, with these with these um, around our, our feeding areas uh, that we're developing as well with the extended season grazing and in this slide here, I mean, this is just a fir and spruce tree kind of grown up. Some of it's been cut off. It, 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 you know, these will they'll provide some logs once in a while when we need the fence posts. And there's a great lounge area. If you look at the soil and the litter on the forest floor there, there's good bedding there and, and nice dry places. So early spring when they calve, they got lots of places to, to go to hide, protect those calves. And in winter in those nasty days in the winter time so one of the other topics uh, i just want to touch on too is the riparian areas on the farm as i mentioned before we we did um, uh, fence all of our streams um, when back in 2000 so the cattle couldn't access it and the, the stream banks i remember as a kid growing up on both sides of this would be would have been uh, bare mud banks um, because we didn't do it at, back then and uh, but this is what happens when you just don't allow access. Now, on the flip side of it, we're at the stage now that some of these, because we have pro provided water um, in other areas that they go to, we can pull the fences up because they're not in there for very long, just through some short rotations and to kind of clean up a little bit of this undergrowth that's under these trees and growing here. And the cattle don't go down in the brook and the stream when they have access to the water source. So these are being developed as well. And just to kind of sum it up, I uh, uh, think, you know, if you have healthy soil, you're going to grow some healthy grasses and clovers and fix the nitrogen, you'll end up with healthy animals and uh, you, know, you should end up with a healthy environment in the end. So thank you for listening. Great. Thank you very much, Dean. It sounds like uh, you and Dr. Burton would have a lot of great conversations around soil health. <laughs> um, and I did have a video here that you um, had asked me to share as well. Um, so I'm going to pop that into the, the chat for all of the attendees to grab at their leisure. Um, and did you want to say anything about the, the video before we move on, Dean? <clears throat> uh no it's it just just that it's it's a good um video to kind of sum up the biogenic carbon cycle and explains the difference of the carbon cycle as coming from cows like with the methane it's it's only a 12-year cycle and there's ways we can kind of reduce it by using cattle and 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 feeding different feed additives and that that we're developing or learning about as opposed to say fossil fuels and that sort of carbon cycle and the and the contribution it makes to the carbon in the environment so that's about it. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, our, moving on to our next speaker, uh, we have Christmas tree producer Richard Levy. Richard got his start and spent his formative years into the late 1960s growing up on a dairy farm in Kings County, Nova Scotia. He worked as a forestry technician in Nova Scotia and, and Alberta and retired from a full time position with the Nova Scotia Department of Lands and Forest Natural Resources in 1999. His interest in Christmas tree farming dates back to the 1970s, and today he and his brother have 43 acres of land in various Christmas tree production stages. He is cur currently serving as president of the Christmas Tree Council of Nova Scotia. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Jen, <clears throat> and uh, nice to uh, be involved with us today. I want to start my um, presentation today with just a very quick and a brief history of the Christmas tree industry in Nova Scotia. Uh, of course, we all know that the Christmas tree is a centerpiece of home decorating during the Christmas season, has been for many generations. The province of Nova Scotia started exporting trees back in the 1920s, uh, when the trees were harvested from natural wild stands and transported to the U.S. markets by train and by boat at that time. These trees were harvested from very densely uh, stocked cutovers that naturally generated in bulks and fur which is the preferred species of Christmas tree because of its pleasant aroma. Nova Scotia has the ideal soil and climate conditions uh, for balsam, and we are envied by many Christmas tree producing areas in North America. Export numbers uh, increased from the 20s when they started to the late 50s when they, when they peaked out 
uh, just under 4 million trees were harvested and exported. Today, that harvest is much smaller, uh, only about 1.3 million. Uh, but today, instead of being uh, shipped by boat and train, they're moved in, uh, in controlled uh, shipping containers where we have temperature control. Our industry is unique in that we manage a single crop of trees that are harvested every 10 years. So our rotation period is quite different than a lot of agriculture crops. Uh, 10 to 15 years, depending on market demand. And how is the industry adapting to climate change today? Uh, I'm going to make some statements and, and elaborate on them just a bit as I go through here. I have a few of them, but uh, I'd like to begin by making just some very general ones. Uh, they aren't necessarily necessary based on science or statistical documentation, but based on observed changes in weather conditions over a period of time. In my 73 plus years, I can state uh, quite certainly that I've noted some major changes from reduced amounts of snow in the winter to changes in our seasons, milder, warmer winters, more frequent and severe rain and storm events, and hotter, drier summers. I will say, however, that referring to our observations as climate change or just simply changes in the weather that the Christmas tree industry participants believe these observations that they have, a, have had a dramatic impact on tree production. They're very real and they are certainly directly related. And just to identify some different areas, number one, I, I refer to as a softer and extended seasonal transition our spring summer. It flips flop, flops from freezing temperatures one day to very mild summer-like conditions another. And we have <clears throat> all experienced what happened in June of 2018 when we had that I refer to as a frost freeze rather than just a frost because the temperature dropped so low, but it severely damaged Christmas trees all across the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, some of them were damaged uh, bad enough that it pretty much eliminated harvest crops that year. And other in other situations, it damaged future crops. Because of our rotation is, is a 10-year period it, in, in any of the trees that might have had an opportunity to recover, it added another three or four years and a, and a lot of increased production costs. The damage varied, interestingly enough, to some lots that had no damage or very little to as much as 90% in others. Number two, our fall season, that's extending well into late November, early December, and it's changing our harvesting and storage and transport methods. When trucking became the preferred method to move trees, we transported in open stake body trucks. And, but the, for the last number of years, we've had to move to temperature control containers to avoid the wind damage during the, uh, the truck transport because they're exposed so much to the wind during the, uh, on the highway travels. But we've also had to change the way we store our trees between harvest and transport. It's become necessary and actually critical that we provide shading areas that minimizes the damage to the trees because of the warmer temperature between harvest and transport. Number three. Uh, we're seeing higher average winter temperatures. We are no longer having those extended periods of well below freezing in the winter that we were so accustomed to, especially when I was younger. But this is causing increases in insects and diseases in our Christmas trees. Uh, industry is rethinking its integrated pest management methods because of these changes. It's finding it necessary, unfortunately, to have to use more pesticides to control. And that's something that we try to avoid as much as possible. In, in the production of Christmas trees. Number four, we are noting an increase in the severity of wind in the late spring and early summer. While the soil is still moist and it's quite soft, and this is causing a loss of some of our larger Christmas trees. Those trees have been left in our lots intentionally as a source of seeds. And because of this, we are unable to maintain our plant density in those natural wild stands because of the loss of our seed trees. And uh, to compensate for that, of course, we're having to, to plant. But uh, Nova Scotia has in the past promoted the Christmas trees from, Nova, from our province as being something that was primarily producing natural. And we called it, we referred to them as wild stands. But those stands are quite uh, intentionally managed as well. But we use that term wild versus plantation style, just simply to indicate the seed source came from trees that were left in the stand versus having to plant. And number five, the spring to summer transition is becoming hotter, drier, and more abrupt, causing a reduction in soil moisture, resulting in higher mortality in the trees that we have to plant in the spring. 
Uh, we had to rely on that to maintain that stocking that we uh, that we're trying to uh, to keep there for future crops. But uh, having lost those seed trees to the to the wind, uh, if this trend continues and we have to have to plant, and and <clears throat> it's always been a practice to plant in the spring, we may have to look at fall planting to, in order to maintain our densities and say in tree production. This is going to have a severe impact on production costs because the fall time for us is a very busy time. Labor is very difficult and hard to find, and it's going to add certainly a, a, an extra cost at that time of year, especially. Number six, with the change in temperatures and oil early soil moisture depletion in the spring slash summer, we are rethinking the best time to put our fertilizer on our trees. If we put it on too early, it forces the, forces the trees to bud early, and then we have that risk of late frost. But we also have to consider putting it on at, at the optimum time for the best fertility uptake for tree development. And we, got, we have to have the rain in order to put that down in where the roots can take advantage of it. And number seven, the overall winter temperatures with warmer, milder periods are causing concern, not only an increase of known insect populations, but we are starting to see insects we haven't previously had to be concerned about in our tree lots. In addition to, in addition to the in, insect concern, we are starting to see a lot more invasive weed plants coming into our tree lots as well. And this is always a concern because often that control method is only through the use of, of pesticide or herbicide, which we, as I in, indicated before, try to keep to a minimum use and only use it where it's absolutely necessary. Our industry has been more reactive than proactive. We, these changes come along and we just, we, we uh, adapt to them, and uh, and that certainly is a reactive position to take. But um, <clears throat> that can be considered a statement that indicates that we don't accept that we are experiencing changes in the weather. Or you can think of the difficult task we are presented with when one considers that we, if we plant seedlings in 2021, we most likely will not harvest those until 2031 or later. Quite different than planting in the spring and harvesting in the fall. So that makes a different approach for us to, to be thinking about. The one area that we have concentrated on, and would, I would say that we've been proactive, is in seed production. Um, seed has traditionally been collected from cones from mature adult trees and, and propagated that way through, through seed and starting seeds to plants. But uh, we've looked at two intentional areas in that uh, selection. One is for needle retention. If we can get the needles to stay on the trees for longer periods, longer than the average, and allows us to transport, transport trees to further destinations. Uh, most of that transport away is, is by boat, and we, uh, we're always uh, faced with the time element to get the boat from loading to destination. The other one that we looked at, we intentionally selected uh, seeds from trees that are naturally late flushing, so the buds don't show until well past the period of concern about frost, and it also avoids some of the impact on insects. Um, the, we are now producing seedling from somatic embryogenesis. It's a laboratory production seedling, which is pretty unique. Uh, the industry, through the Christmas Tree Council, have just recently completed an extensive Christmas tree research program. This was done through Dalhousie at AC and Truro under the leadership of Dr. Raj Lada. The project and the tree, the, the project was identified as SMART, and I'll, I'll just leave those, S-M-A-R-T. It's a senescence modulated, obsessant regulated technology. Now you know why I prefer to use SMART. But we are expected to have somewhere in the vicinity of 40,000 SMART tree seedlings available in 2022, with increasing numbers in years to follow. Our goal in the near future is to producing a million SMART tree seedlings annually to meet the demand. There's a lot of interest in, uh, in, a, in New Brunswick and Quebec and, and the Eastern Seaboard US for these tree seedlings. Right now, it's impossible to buy seeds or buy uh, transplant seedlings. Uh, the US markets are sold out. There's nothing in Canada available unless you've spoken well in advance. There are growers that are asking for seed uh, plant, plantless to plant and they're putting on, being put on a waste, waiting list for as much as four to five years. Right now. There's a very good demand for, for trees, and that's uh, it's causing um, people to want to plant and, and get ready to harvest in 10 years. But in summary, 
Attempting to evaluate climate change against one's lifespan becomes a problem, considering that one's life only experiences such a relatively short window in terms of time. And we can be lulled into complacency when it comes to our personal impact to affect long-term change. Thinking in terms of most crops harvested in five to six months or less compared to Christmas trees, 10 to 15 years before that one-time harvest takes place makes it even more difficult when we're thinking about making those changes. I will, however, in closing, state very clearly that the things we as individuals in our respective industries can do today that can help mitigate the challenges of climate change that will be faced by future generations may not have been so important to my grandfather, but they are really important to my children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, I definitely appreciate that last sentiment that you, you shared. Um, so for just before we move on to our next speaker, we do have two uh, speakers left in our session today. And I did want to remind the audience to use the Q&A or the chat function to ask questions to the panelists as we uh, continue on. Uh, we should have some time to answer those questions at the end of the session. Um, our next speaker today is Greg Garretts from Elmridge Farm. Elmridge Farm began in 1954 as a mixed farm and then was a dairy farm for almost three de decades before Greg began building into the vegetable operation and is today with 175 acres of intensive vegetable production, wholesaling, retailing, and processing done by a team of more than 50 full and part-time staff. The focus is on value added sales, including online and wholesale to independent retailers. Based on demand from retail consumers, an approach of reducing conventional pesticide use as much as possible was adopted to give Elmridge products an edge over large scale convention, conventional products. The farm has been a leader in new technology like a 100 kilowatt solar field and weed pulling robot. Please join me in welcoming Greg today. Hello. Change over. I'll get, just give me a second. My uh, techie's doing something for me here. Not a problem. <laughs> I'm either too old or too stubborn. <laughs> Great. Either, either too old or too stubborn to learn. I'll just say too old. Uh, okay, so I was approached in January to be a part of this, this session. And so I was all ready to give an analysis of the changes I've seen in my industry and the things we've done to you know, counter some of the problems, some things we've taken advantage of. Um, but then another approach started building in my mind over the months and, uh, sometime on Monday, I said, you know what, I'm going to throw caution to the wind and take a fully different approach than what might have been expected. But, um, there's a really big picture story to be seen here. I think that we all need to be, um, cognizant of in order to, uh, work to, overcome whatever challenges, I guess we'll say, that uh, climate change throws our way. So, um, so I'm, uh, we're just a small entity, Elmridge Farm, and we're working within a, a huge uh, machine, I guess we'll call it. Um, and we're just one small part. And the question is, how do you, how do you survive under those conditions? And as a quick disclaimer, I'm certainly not trying to single anyone out and fully acknowledge that there are many proponents of agriculture, both in government and in society as a whole, but something's not adding up. Uh, dealing with climate change is a much more complex problem than just the weather changes and the challenges we will undoubtedly face. In the end, it's not the details of how we deal with climate change that will determine our success or failure as an industry. It's the man-made forces that are now more of a factor than the actual natural forces in agriculture that will I think, determine our fate. Um, weather is likely to continue to change. Um, we've all been told it's going to get, uh, you know, stronger wind, heavier rain, um, more variable, less dependable, uh, basically a loss of stability. And that's a stability that our industry so dearly needs uh, if farming families are going to survive. Um, agriculture requires commitment and investment for not just 
decades, but generations to, to stay viable. Um, so um, it's very much a long, the long game, I guess. And for that reason, uh, our political system has, the way it operates, we have very often not benefited from that because unfortunately, uh, the powers that be look at a much smaller window and we need to, we need to really look at the long term. Um, <clears throat> so over the years, the farming community, especially like I've been at this since the early 1990s, um, we've really proven that we are able to overcome seemingly insurmountable problems and, and still, I'm not gonna say thrive because it's been a real struggle for many of us, but we are still here and we are still not backing down, I guess. Um, and I'm very sure that we can meet the challenges that the actual climate change uh, presents us with and take advantage of some of the benefits, but um, we need to have social and um, political support to do that. We can't, it's, it's not, yeah, that, those are gonna be very, very important factors. Um, so and what doesn't help us is the fact that we have survived against unseen, you know, seemingly impossible odds for so long that um, I think it's only supporting the opinion of much of society that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll ride this wave too. But uh, it's, not, it's absolutely not clear to me uh, whether the man-made political and social climates will give us the priority and opportunity we need to be strong enough to adapt to climate change. Um, <clears throat> it's almost impossible as an industry in a small corner of the earth to noticeably change uh, the climate uh, through our own personal actions. Not that we haven't um, actually, you know, worked hard to do. I forgot about my slides. Ha <laughs> ha. Anyways, uh, not that we haven't worked hard to do our part in that. Um, you know, we, we have done our part and we'll continue to do our part. And, and that's a good thing. And I think all farmers uh, share that interest in, in keeping what we have, you know, good. Um, but I think our, our best hopes lie in altering the social and political climate to work with us and solve the big elephant in the room, as I'm gonna call it, which is a lack of profitability in this industry. Um, that has turned every little hiccup into a crisis. Now, understandably, climate change is really a big hiccup, but uh, um, we, you know, if we're strong, we can deal with it. Um, so, and the reason we're having problems with profitability is that we are expected to tow the social line on values, um, you know, different social values, and but we are rarely compensated for that. And so, I see an obvious you know, as climate warms up and water, especially in, in the vegetable industry becomes more scarce, I think it will become more scarce during the growing season. An obvious climate uh, conflict is with, uh, you know, water supply. And so we have groups in our society that want to save as much natural aquatic habitat as possible. Um, but the question is who's gonna pay for that and how does that look? And if we have to have, develop water supply, um, beyond pumping from streams, uh, who's to pay for that? And for those who think that the farmer should pay for that, I strongly disagree because we have uh, no way to recoup that cost uh, because the borders stay open to every type of foreign uh, produce you can think of. So to tell the story about Elmridge Farm and how uh, climate change has affected who we are and what we are. Um, I'm gonna start back way at the beginning in the early 1990s. Uh, we started off as a very small farm. Um, we had just transitioned from uh, dairy and we started at the Halifax City Farmer's Market and that's how we made our living at first. We also tried to do some wholesaling into the big box stores, but very quickly realized that on a smaller scale that was not profitable. And so we put our emphasis on supplying our uh, retail uh, customers and, and slowly developing uh, wholesale to smaller independent grocers. 
And at first that wasn't profitable either, but I think how climate played a, a role in us becoming profitable was that at that time, between the 1990s and the early 2000s, the seasons were getting longer, the springs were getting warmer. We were able to expand our, what I call high season. So when we have the maximum available product ready for sale fresh, uh, we were able to expand that uh, by pushing hard at the first of the season and, and really trying to extend the end of the season. Um, and, and so we used the change in, in climate to, to lengthen our season and become more profitable. Um, so what's happened though in the last few years is that we've had uh, late cold springs later than we, we have had for quite some time. And we've had early frost or damaging winds or rains or whatever at the tail end of the season that has shortened our season on both ends. But what that does is reduce the number of weeks that we are at peak season and therefore dramatically reduces our profit margin. So the, the variability in the climate in the last number of years has really hit us hard in, in the bottom line. Um, and that's where the volatility of the, the weather in the last few, few years has hit us. Here's uh, sweet potatoes that are dead before their time. Um, and then a uh, crop of beans has been beat up by a, a hurricane. And uh, to the untrained eye, that might look like a nice green field. But believe me, to my eye, that looks like devastation. Um, so the, the whole industry worldwide has had to take bigger risks on, in order to become profitable. And we're no exception around here. We are, we're you know, pushing the seas and the, pushing the, the envelope, so to speak, on both ends. Uh, in order to stay profitable, and maybe those days are over. Um, but we continue, continue to uh, plant as early as possible and, uh, you know, push the seeds as much as we can on the tail end because, uh, as Richard said, a lifetime is, is, a, is a, a blip in the grand scheme of things, and definitely three years is nothing to... It hasn't been fun, but uh, it doesn't determine what things might be from here on in, and I think we're still in transition to who knows what else. Um, so anyone that also, I guess, anyone that knows our business knows that we grow so many vegetables types that it's easier to say what we don't grow than what we do grow. And in theory, that uh, that that um, mix, that um, diversity, should be you know a real answer for uh, for being. Uh, uh, stable, I guess, in, in what are becoming unstable weather times. But unfortunately, the social and political climate have worked against us on that. Um, you know, the food safety regulations that are coming down the pipe have, uh, you know, they, they've, they've made it so that some of our, our minor crops, as we try to be compliant, uh, are not really worth growing anymore. It's just become too complicated. We can't do it. So we've dropped the number of crops. And then on the other side, the minimum wage has come up quite quickly. And I mean, I'm not going to argue that people should be, you know, paid for their effort. But the problem is we can't recoup that cost uh, because still the borders are wide open. And so what we've done is tried to go to mechanization to reduce that labor cost. Um, we're up two and a half dollars an hour this year over 2018. And that in our farm is $175,000. And that's not peanuts on any farm. Uh, and so we have to make $175,000 more this year in profit to come out the same results we would have in 2018. Um, so we're, we're looking at mechanization. But there again, uh, the human, you know, humans are very able to go from one job to the next um, and, and, and do many things, whereas machines are very specific. and all farmers know they're horribly expensive. So there we've had to narrow our, our, uh, our vision again, I guess, as the number of crops are growing and reduces diversity some more. And so diversity is now <laughs> not at all what it was for um, us in the form of stability. So having said all that, um, it's certainly not all doom and gloom for us. Um, I'm a... a a horrible optimist and uh you know we got what we're doing basically we're taking uh, 
the lemons that nature and, and life are handing us and uh, we're going to try to make some lemonade. Um, so <clears throat> to replace the stability that we lack, um, you know, that we've lost to climate change and in the irregularity in the, in the weather, um, we are trying to replace it with, with a shelf stable product, a value added product. Um, the problem with my business as far as stability goes outside of weather is that everything is fresh, uh, slight changes, a heat wave, a long dark spell, a hurricane changes um, everyone's attention away from fresh good food for a bit. And that's all it takes for us to have a big loss because um, we've only got a very short window of opportunity to sell once we harvest it. So we need to get something more stable. And what we have come to the conclusion of is that we take wasted products such as uh, these sweet potatoes in this picture that are too small to be marketed for most part. Um, and we want to, we're building a new facility to try to transform those into a shape, shelf stable uh, product. In this case, we are looking to make, uh, use a dehydrator to make dog treats, um, pet food ingredients, dehydrated products, soup mixes, powders, whatever. And the beauty of this is that it will now have uh, shelf stability. Um, so it, it, it kind of replaces some of the stability we've lost. Um, so anyway, so in conclusion, I guess, um, I would like to say that our society has become ever more removed from nature and complacent about its grip on us, but agriculture is still where humanity meets, meets reality. And every farmer can attest to how precarious our food supply really is. I am often more amazed that we can keep it all together and put food on tables than I am shocked by devastation such as in this photo um, that we sometimes face. Uh, food supply is taken for granted uh, by most of our society, again, because we've had good times for the last 50 years and most lifetimes aren't long enough to see beyond that. Um, and we're in, we're in a country that's seemingly on a safety crusade. Um, it's everything's about safety, but there is nothing safe about a struggling agricultural industry. Um, agriculture is the third largest industry in Nova Scotia and any support and consideration given to agriculture will come back to benefit the entire province in the form of a vibrant, profitable industry that can withstand change and will strengthen our society. Uh, we are not, as agriculture, the burden that so many people believe us to be. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the biggest current challenges in agriculture is labor. And on Elmridge Farm, that is absolutely the problem too. I mean, we have guys here weeding and that's a very expensive business. Um, and so part of mechanization is trying to mechanize the weed pulling and that leads up to our next speaker very well. Um, so I was trying to solve various problems mechanically on the farm and surfing the net and lo and behold, I've stumbled over a company called Nexus Robotics and they had a team working to develop uh, what I consider to be the holy grail in my business of pesticide free agriculture. And it's a machine that can actually pull weeds. Um, so one thing led to another. And in the summer of 2019, Tarek Greenan from Nexus and his team ended up at our place for the summer. It was one of the most interesting experiences of my life. And he is here today to tell us more about what's going on. Great, thank you very much, Greg. I feel like you stole my introduction for uh, Tarek, but I'm sure that I have still have a little bit to say for him. Um, and I do wanna say, I appreciate the pictures. I feel as though they're very impactful of some of the damage that you've seen or the impacts from climate change over the last number of years, because they have been very significant. So anyway, thank you very much for sharing. Um, our final speaker today, as Greg said, is Tarek Greenan, uh, the COO and founder of Nexus Robotics. Tarek is from Halifax and ran a small vegetable farm in Lunenburg County, Nova Scotia for three years. He often spoke to larger producers at the local farmer's market about challenges with weeding and other rep repetitive tasks, which inspired the idea to create Nexus Robotics. At Nexus, Tarek is responsible for commercial development and communicating the needs of the farmers to the technical design team. So please uh, welcome, welcome, or join me in welcoming Tarek to our screens as well. And I'm gonna pass it over to you. Hello, everyone. 
Greg gave me uh, a very great introduction, so I'm happy about that. And uh, as Greg was saying, the, the main things that we're focused on solving currently with our robot is the labor costs and availability, as well as herbicide resistance. These are widespread challenges that we're seeing throughout agriculture, uh, especially in vegetable production. And this is an international problem. This is happening all over the globe, not just in Canada. And so we set out to build a robot that can help solve some of these challenges and more. We are currently uh, testing an, a new prototype that we designed this past year. Uh, it's being tested in Florida near Tampa Bay right now. So this is actually a, a fairly recent video that was shot. Uh, it's just with a cell phone camera, so it's not the best quality, but the goal for this season was to increase the weeding speed a tremendous amount. Uh, this past season, we were able to get the accuracy of weed pulling up to around 95% weed removal, but the, the problem was that it was still really slow. And so the goal with this new prototype that we've built is to maintain that, that level of accuracy, but greatly increase the speed. So we've managed to, to do mostly that with, with this new prototype, and we'll just see short little video here. These beds are very narrow, but uh, as you can see, there's three arms on the robot now, and that will allow us to uh, much more quickly remove a lot of the weeds. And the idea with the gripper is that we want to be able to mimic what human fingers do, uh, because humans are very good at removing weeds that are close to the crop without actually damaging the crop. And by having a gripper, uh, we can mimic what humans do as best as we can. And so this is one of the, the new prototypes that's currently being built. And we're going to have three of them uh, for this season, one of, of which is going to be on Greg's farm this season. And the vision as a whole uh, is much bigger than, than just weeding. And that's kind of how we connect back to the, the climate challenge. I think that farmers overall have a really good sense of what the best approach is to keep healthy soil and to mitigate climate change. But I think one of the things that's really holding farmers back right now is that agriculture has much less uh, digital improvement than many other industries. And that's really what we're trying to help, help farmers with is, can we build a tool that is gonna give farmers better control over their farm, uh, allow them to do some of these repetitive tasks that are very uh, resource intensive? Can we give them better information to make uh, more informed decisions about how to operate the farm? And we, uh, we feel like if we're able to uh, bring robotics and bring artificial intelligence to farmers to uh, enhance their decision-making, we're going to be able to address climate change uh, as, as an industry. Uh, that's, that, that's our approach. And uh, that's why we're uh, very passionate about uh, building this technology for farmers. That's my presentation. Uh, I have the contact information, that's my email, as well as our website, nexusrobotics.ca. So if you want more information or have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you very much, Tarek. Uh, so we are right on time here. We've got about uh, 15 minutes left for questions for our panel. Um, and just to kind of recap what we what we heard today, uh, Dr. Burton started us off with uh, setting the stage for the interaction between climate and agriculture. Um, and Dean Manning gave us a good overview of cattle um, and grazing management um, and how that has changed to adapt to, to climate change. Um, Richard uh, discussed adaptations to Christmas tree producers have made uh, to climate change, including converting to planting uh, trees as opposed to uh, natural propagation. 
And then Greg was um, always looking forward to new opportunities is, is kind of at the end, uh, forced adaptation in a very challenging climate. Uh, definitely a good uh, comment for our theme today. So I am going to uh, go to a few questions here. And thank you again to all of our speakers. Um, and I will start off by, I think everyone can answer this question, but I'll start off by addressing it to uh, Richard. Uh, climate change adaptation is sometimes about preparing proactively, and this can be a difficult case to make uh, when farmers and producers have so many other priorities. What do you think makes a persuasive case to adapt now? Oh, you're muted, you're muted Richard. <laughs> Oh, you're still muted there, Richard. I think you'll have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I I, I think we've got to we've got to uh, be very cognizant of what of the changes that we're experiencing on a day to day basis. Uh, we've all made reference to the changes in our seasons, and uh, I think that I think that and I'll speak for the Christmas tree industry specifically. Of course, I think there are many things that we haven't yet considered that we can do because we've always. We've always uh, experienced that our lots seeded in naturally and we just managed what we had in front of us. And, and now we're realizing that because of the changes in the climate that, that it's, it's stressing some of those uh, taken for granted situations that we've, um, we've always been involved with. And, and we are making those changes very gradually, but um, I, I think that there's a, there's a climate now in our industry that's starting to put more emphasis on, on the identification of those changes and we're working towards making the changes that are necessary for us to continue to produce trees economically. Um, it's, it's been a strain for a number of years because the price wasn't there for us to be very profitable, uh, as, as has been mentioned in some of the other commodities as well, but, uh, but we're seeing good demand and we're seeing higher prices. We're hoping to get more people involved in the, uh, in the industry. And, uh, and we're gonna, I think, I think through the Christmas Tree Council, which oversees the the, uh, the complete industry in Nova Scotia. I think that we're going to be able to offer. We have a we have a phenomenal team working now, and I think that we're going to be able to offer new growers some some great uh, information and 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 uh, and the knowledge that we've gained over the years with experience, but also making changes as we adapt. Thank you very much, Richard. And I, I'm going to ask the same question to you, Dean, as well. What do you think makes a persuasive case to adapt now? Oh well, I, I think it's I think we've history in the last few years have shown us that we're going to have to regardless. And I, Greg kind of touched on a pretty good topic there, the social responsibility. I think he alluded to. Um, I think you know, like agriculture is a is a private, it's kind of a private business with a huge public uh, interest. So the, your neighbors and the public have to be interested, and you know, individual farms are going to have to sit down and prioritize what they're going to do, what they're seeing is, um, as, uh, you know, areas are weak in climate change that they're going to have to adapt to. But uh, I think the community has to buy into that as well. So, you know, like in terms of fresh water, I mean, right on the head, you know, hit the nail right on the head. Water is a huge, huge issue. And um, if you don't have fresh water, um, it really limits to what you can do. So, um, so th those are a couple of things that come right to mind. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I'm gonna go to uh, you, Greg. I'll let you you add your two cents there. What do you think makes a persuasive case to adapt now? Because a good offense is a good defense. <laughs> a good defense, a good offense. Um, yeah, we, 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 while we have resources, I mean, the further down the road we go without doing things, the harder it's going to hit us, the less resources we have to correct the problem. And uh, financing in agriculture is a tough, tough business in any way, shape, or form to keep the bills paid. Um, so we can't afford to slide any further. We need to stay ahead of this thing. And I'll say it again, it's, we can't do it by ourselves the social and political climates are going to have to change somehow or, or every problem we run into, and this is not a small problem, I don't think in the end, uh, is going to be a huge issue. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. 
Uh, and we have a, a question here in the chat for you, uh, Dr. Burton. Uh, what are the four R practices? Do you mind taking a moment to comment on those? Uh, certainly, I, I'm sorry. That was that was a part of a, my presentation. I cut out around nitrogen fertilizer management, but um, the four R practices are a, a suite of practices that the fertilizer industry has instituted to try to help us increase the efficiency of nutrient use efficiency, both phosphorus and nitrogen. They involve using the right product uh, in the right at the right rate, in the right at the right time, and in the right place to to really hone in our use of nutrients such that we're using them as efficiently as possible to support uh, agronomic production and profitability, but also to minimize environmental impact. Great, thank you very much. Um, and we have another question here. Uh, what networks, forums uh, do farmers have to exchange information and knowledge about adaptation and mitigation or shared strategies and solutions? So where, where would you typically go for your, your information, Greg? I surf, surf the net, <laughs> I guess. And um, my mind never stops working. So I'm always trying to figure things out even when I want to stop thinking. Uh, so if I have another 20 minutes, I can tell you all the different things we did on our farm. But a lot of it is, is get out there, see the world, be cognizant of what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, in Nova Scotia, I think we are far too inward looking. Uh, there's too many people that have no idea what goes on elsewhere. And I think for farmers, especially, it's very important for us to see the huge picture and see what other people are doing and, and, and think. <laughs> I mean, I hope that the talk I gave is a catalyst for thought. I want people to think about what, what, why are we really where we are? And uh, anyway, big picture, internet, look at the world. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And and Dean, from your perspective, you sit on quite a few national committees over the last number of years, so I'm sure that that has been a good forum for fodder for you. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think one of the biggest things that a lot of producers can do is is get out to these conferences and sessions, whether it's even even local where you have speakers come in and engage. I know um, on the climate change, you know, file or portfolio there, the Beef Cattle Research Council is starting to do a lot of work on that. It's one of the pillars, so there's going to be more coming from there. So um, just locally and nationally, we try to draw them in. And, um, you know, and there's all the resources. I mean, we do have the internet that we can pull in. I mean, for sure, Perina has lots of uh, specialists that we can pull in and get that catalyst to move. Great. Thank you, Dean. And uh, Richard, from the Christmas tree perspective, then what is your sharing like in this nature? And you're, you're muted again, Richard. One little kick of the button can make so much difference, can't it, Dave? Uh, the, Christ the Christmas Tree Council of Nova Scotia has intentionally produced, uh, we have a Christmas tree journal that comes out uh, four times a year. And we are, we are publicizing as much information as we can for the Christmas tree producers to become aware of what's going on uh, in, in all areas, whether it's insects or climate change or new technologies or new ways of, of doing um, uh, production and, and market demands and all those kind of things. So we're fortunate that there's a lot of work being done south of the border uh, with the Christmas tree promotion board and, and that's really helped the demand on trees on, on our side. But, but um, we're trying to encourage uh, Christmas tree growers to become involved with their local organizations and it's already been mentioned Dean mentioned there about about becoming aware of what's going on around I think for the looking at the Christmas tree industry um, because our rotation of crop is uh, you know I talked 10 to 15 years um, in a lifetime that's not a lot of rotations however our lots have trees of all different sizes and so we do harvest every year so it's not like we have to wait 10 or 15 unless we specifically have plantations and if we only have one plantation we're not going to harvest very often <laughs> but uh, but if we can encourage our growers to be involved with the organizations it's a great exchange there's, there's hundreds of years of experience out there for for many years growers operated almost in isolation they had a great, they had a chance to sell their trees to, to a buyer and they never really had to do anything but grow the tree and get it to market. But now the customer is demanding quite a different product. 
And if you don't stay in tune with what's going on around you with, with technologies and the changes and the demands, you're going to fall by the wayside and you can't be profitable if you do that. So that's, that's where we're, we're, we're moving in that direction. Just get that information exchanged the, the best, the most efficient way possible so everybody can be aware of it. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we do have uh, a question in the, the Q&A. I'm not quite sure who to direct it to, so I'm going to just read it out here, and whoever would like to jump on it is welcome. Uh, the United Nations declares three rights, food, shelter, and clothing. Nova Scotia has over 1 million acres of unused farmland in Nova Scotia. How can we use this template for the greater common good and raise the bar for production, respectively? Um, especially regarding the fact just 80 years ago, we were 100% food secure, and today we are 8 to 12% sufficient. I feel like that's quite a lofty question. So who would like to take a stab at it? I, I can start. I always like to jump in on these things anyway. But, you know, th that's a good point there. And, and um, I'm going to speak on uh, the terms of it, you know, on, on the cattle or even the livestock part of it. As I mentioned before, I, I think you need a balance of everything to make uh, a complete cycle. And because, I mean, there's um, soil microbiomes, there's plant microbiomes, and then there's animal microbiomes, and they all kind of work together. And I think they all need one another. So um, I don't think there's any one particular crop or one particular species you go with, but I think you, you develop a multifaceted, um, uh, kind of like a complex one. And that, that way you've got all your bases covered and like we had in the past, because, you know, if you look at some of our key agriculture producing areas, that that's one thing that is key about them is there is a diversity there. So, so that's, that's kind of what I, I envision. Great. I'd like, you. I'd like to jump in a little bit here too, I guess. Um, the first thing I do is look at, okay, why are so many acres left abandoned in, in this province? And it, it goes back to the economic situation yet again. Um, we need the right economic climate to do what we do. We've lost comp com you know, competitivity uh, or the ability to compete with the world here. And we are still expected to. And a lot of it has to do with unnatural forces, I'll call them, but they're, you know, social constructs in the form of, of, of laws and, and social expectations. And that, hit, that I, every day I deal with frustrations that are directly linked to that. And I think that's what's pushing our industry back. And from the point of view of one particular idea I've had a bunch of times, just had a chance to put it out there. Um, we're, we're dealing with a forestry industry that's um, obviously the way it's going is not sustainable. Uh, there's new technology out there now that can make paper with 1% the amount of power and 2 or 3% the amount of water it takes to produce paper from, uh, so it can make paper out of grass, sorry, uh, with that small footprint compared to what it takes to make it out of trees. Well, what a beautiful way to reboot an industry. Uh, let's get that old plant off idle. Let's go for the future instead of hanging on to the past. Thanks, Greg. We've got about two minutes left here. So Dave, I saw you would like to make a comment. Yeah, I just want to comment on the question as a consumer of food, not a producer of food. I think one of the challenges that we have to realize as consumers is that food costs. We've enjoyed cheap food for far too long and we've taken it for granted. Uh, housing prices are going through the roof, the cost of everything else is going through the roof, yet we expect food to be cheap. I think if we want to have a safe, secure, sustainable food supply system, we have to realize that we have to invest more in our food supply and pay for the sustainable practices that, that, that would allow those acres in, in Nova Scotia to be economically developed and, and, and uh, produce food crops and other biomass crops as well. And so it, we, we need to take that on as, as consumers to, to invest more in our food and our, our sustainability. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so we have pretty much reached the end of our time today. Um, I wanted to thank the uh, audience for all the wonderful questions. It was obviously great fodder for discussion. Um, and obviously uh, sincerely thank our terrific speakers today. 
the and I do know that there's a few questions we didn't get to. So as I'd mentioned previously, the, the contact information for our panelists will be made available to all of the attendees today. So if you'd like to reach out to them to ask any particular questions, I'm sure they'd be welcome to entertaining them. Um, the PDFs and a recording of this session will be available soon at uh, perennia.ca and on Perennia's YouTube page. And uh, finally, uh, thank you so much to the minister for presenting this exciting digital series. I think it's everyone is, has taken something away from today. Um, and a quick reminder, there are two sessions remaining in the Minister of Agriculture's digital series that, we, that were shared at the beginning of the presentation, but please visit our website to register for those. Um, and thank you to our session, our series sponsors, Farm Credit Canada and the Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Board and our session sponsors, Nexus Robotics and Dalhousie University Faculty of Agriculture. And I think we're ending just on time. So uh, thank you again to our panelists and take care everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>